we would determine what criminal offenses were and what the eligible punishments would be. What did that mean? Um, in practice, they wanted to try to employ a strategy of getting smart on incarceration. So they wanted to lower the number of people who were going into the Texas prison system by decreasing the, um, the risk of um, entering prison for low-level offenders, individuals charged with felony drug possession of less than one gram. And uh, just to make sure that we're all on the same page, felony drug possession is not going to be things like marijuana. We're talking about crack, heroin, cocaine, um, and other types of illicit drugs. And then property offenses between valued between uh, $1,500 and $20,000. So they're going to decrease the likelihood that these individuals are going to prison. And then they're actually going to ramp up um, the risk of um, staying in prison longer for felony dependents. So they're going to increase their sentencing range. So this seems like um, a situation that would actually create more leniency after the um, penal code went into effect in 1994, which is actually the opposite of what we saw in practice. We saw the diversion rate plummet after um, September 1st, 1994. And what was, uh, what was the reason why that happened? They actually, in the way they adopted the law, there was an unintended effect of lowering their parole rates. So you're gonna have to stick with me here. This is a little uh, convoluted, but there was a requirement in place for these low level offenders that they had to be offered um, or put on probation before they could be incarcerated for anybody sentenced to incarceration. Right? So nobody who is a low level first time offender would get put in prison anymore. Now, for those who are, have deferred adjudication, they're also put on probation, but they haven't yet legally be sent, been sentenced. So the concern that prosecutors had was that if somebody was put on a deferred adjudication or diversionary agreement, if they violated that agreement, they could be brought in, convicted, and sentenced to be incarcerated. But by law, they would have to be given another bite of the apple. They would get another chance at probation. And they thought that without this stick to threaten compliance with the diversion agreements, nobody would take it seriously. They would all just kind of screw up their first uh, chance and then uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, not comply with their supervi community supervision or not get their job or go out and use drugs when they aren't supposed to be but then get that second chance at probation. So they actually announced um, in anticipation of September 1st, 1994, that this was a problem. And they had this big press conference with a simulated plea deal where they showed that none of the prosecutors are gonna be using diversion anymore. But the Texas legislature only meets every two years, so they could not fix the issue before the law went into effect. And so it was fully anticipated that cases that were being brought after September 1st that they were not going to be applying uh, diversion agreements anymore. Now then that raises the question, you know, was there some sort of selective sorting about what cases were brought and when? Um, and actually, uh, there are a lot of institutional details that actually help with this. Uh, when cases are booked, they have to be charged within 48 hours. So there's actually limited ability for uh, defendants to sort onto either side, whether through the prosecutor or the defense, um, uh, trying to manipulate when they're charged. Okay. It does raise a question about whether or not there would be a general deterrent response. Does anybody know what the concept of general deterrence is? Yep. Just that people know it'll be more harsh, so they're going to be less likely theoretically to commit crimes at that point. Exactly. So we think that we uh, actually the the major goal of the justice system is to prevent crimes from happening in the first place. We generally don't take pleasure in harming individuals um, by incarcerating them or applying sanctions that we know will potentially screw up their life. The point of it is to try to prevent crimes from occurring in the first place. And so there could be a response where if individuals know that now diversion is no longer going to be used, we could see a spike in the crime rate, or sorry, a reduction in the crime rate after this law goes into effect. And that's just not actually something we see in practice, but it's an important concern to have. All right, so this is 1994. Let's go forward to 2007. Overcrowding is a theme um, in Texas and Houston in particular. Um, the overcrowding issues did not go away. Um, if I, 2005, uh, there were close to 2,000 inmates sleeping on the ground in the Harris County Jail. So this is the Houston jail system. Um, there was very serious uh, overcrowding issues. Uh, as part of a modernization package that was on the ballot in 2007, 
Um, there was Proposition 3, which was going to raise $200 million to expand the jail through constructing a new unit. There were already three units that were going to build a fourth. And the, um, again, this was part of a total bond package of $1 billion uh, to modernize infrastructure. The pre-election debate raised concerns of, uh, regarding the jail construction bond. So one issue that was raised were the proposed location, uh, was the proposed location that the to harm local economic development. Uh, it was gonna be along um, some of the waterways and there was concern that this would prevent future opportunities of developing that space. Um, Second was that people were blaming the courts for the overcrowding crisis, that if they relied less on pretrial detention, uh, that they could actually reduce the overcrowding in the first place and potentially make the system work more functionally for everyone involved. And if you just expanded the jail capacity, they would fill it up and end up in another <coughs> overcrowding situation. And what was quite surprising, because Harris uh, County is a tough on crime city in uh, Texas, which is a tough on crime state, it was very narrowly rejected, right? The vote came in as, as uh, 50.6% of the electorate that was voting that um, year to 49.4, whereas all of the other bond initiatives were passed. All right, so what you can see is that next week, courts responded by increasing their deferral and dismissal rates amongst low risk uh, cases. So this solved two issues. One was uh, decreasing the inflow of individuals into the jail system. So they're basically turning off the faucet of people going into the Harris County Jail. And the second is responding to the critics uh, of the court that were being raised up here because judges and prosecutors face electoral incentives. So the district attorney is a publicly elected official. Judges are publicly elected officials in, in Texas. And so they wanted to be responsive uh, to those criticisms. All right, and so what do we see across these two different events? Going back to the first picture, we see this major drop where diversion rates are decreased by 25, 24 percentage points in 1994 for those charged just one day versus the next around September 1st. And then in 2007, you see an increase of diversion rates of about 20 percentage points uh, for those uh, disposed one day versus the next. Okay. So this data, we've already seen some of the results of this project, uh, but this data is going to be working with administrative data sets. Does anybody know what an administrative data set is? Anybody working on like a senior thesis? Oh, so, um, it's okay. Uh, so data comes in a variety of different forms. Normally you might be familiar with things like the current population survey or the American community survey or the SIP or the PSID, these are survey-based collections where we go out, we find individuals, we have some sort of smart strategy to figure out how to sample them out of the population, and then we ask them about what's going on in their lives. <coughs> there are issues with this type of data collection, so we worry about things like, are we actually getting a rep representative sample? Um, who is uh, not responding to the survey? What types of attrition bias might be there? But then also, how are people potentially shaping their responses given the fact that this is happening in a social setting? Um, it, we worry about things like social desirability bias. Would somebody accurately report whether or not they've been convicted of a crime? In contrast, what the data that we're going to be working with is known as administrative data. This is not something that's produced for research purposes. This is electronic records that are generated in the regular course of business all across the country every single day by nonprofits, by public agencies, by private companies. These are the things that are coming up in case management systems. And things like, uh, in your life, your um, grades and your enrollment records at BYU, that would be a source of administrative data that could be used for research purposes. Now that doesn't mean that we have the level of detail that we always might want, um, or that we can have in something like survey data, so we don't have any psychometric measures of um, uh, mental health or drug addiction or something like that. But what we do get is potentially unbiased measures of things like criminal activity, um, sentencing outcomes for the entire population at a low cost. So this is going to combine the universe of Harris County criminal court records, um, which is part of our broader data collection that I've done from 1980 all the way through the present, 
um, with statewide convictions uh, from a database that's created by the Texas Department of Public Safety to track convictions in the state of Texas. We also have jail and prison records from Harris County Sheriff's Office as well as the Texas Department of Criminal Justice and unemployment insurance wage records from the Texas Workforce Commission. And so we're going to be linking these things together uh, based off of things like names, states of birth, social security numbers, uh, which we have to take on faith are accurately linking the records together, but conditional on um, having some faith in the merging process can allow us to see a lot of information about how somebody's life is evolving over time um, with somewhat coarse measures like reoffending and uh, quarterly wages. So in case you've uh, forgotten your econometrics class, or you haven't taken it yet, um, regression discontinuity design is a strategy for um, doing causal inference where we're looking at a setting where we have a forcing variable, um, which is going to be this x-axis, where we have something that is um, going to be used for assigning some sort of program status, the probability of a given outcome. In this case, we're going to be talking about diversion as well, what's on the y axis, the probability of getting a diversion. And it's not that we think that um, the relationship between um, diversion and whatever your forcing variable is uh, completely uncorrelated, um, that it's compl or, sorry, completely exogenous. Uh, it doesn't have to be that it's uh, randomly assigned everywhere, but we think that because there's some sort of discretionary um, or discontinuous cutoff rule, that within a neighborhood, if you can see down here, there's like a little c, a c prime, and a c double prime, which is kind of, because it's small, emphasizes the point. In a small neighborhood around the cutoff, we might have a population that um, is both observably um, similar uh, as well as uh, comparable on unobservable margins as well. Okay, so it's kind of like a flip of the coin whether or not you ended up on this side of the red line or that side of the red line. And so by measuring the difference here in terms of their enrollment or future outcomes, we can try to assess what the impact of a program is on um, uh, uh, future activity. When all right, so potential threats to identification or reasons why um, this uh, could not be interpreted in a causal way. Like what could be going wrong with the data or the way that the natural experiment played out that would corrupt this kind of natural experiment. So uh, we're relying on the assumption that uh, effective random assignment uh, from uh, one charge or disposition date to the next, right? That in the neighborhood, it's kind of like a flip of the coin whether or not you were lucky or not. And potential violations could arise if, for instance, prosecutors are timing their charges according to the regime change, so they want to really um, stick it to some types of defendants versus others, or uh, prosecutors changed what would be charged before and after a change so that they could make sure that something uh, was or wasn't affected by the alteration of this um, uh, probation before incarceration requirement. Uh, it could be that prosecutors started declining to prosecute certain defendants, so they wouldn't even show up in the data set to begin with. Or smart defense attorneys could be trying to help their clientele avoid harsh regimes. Or there could be this issue of a general deterrent response that changes the composition of offenders. And so all of these different mechanisms would generate what we call selection bias across the threshold. So that when we go from the left side of the threshold to the right side of the threshold, these actually aren't comparable populations. There, there could be observable or unobservable differences between these groups that are actually driving the changes in outcomes that we observe, not actually the difference in diversion rates. All right, so there are some institutional uh, features that provide safeguards to these threats. So one is that individuals have to be charged within 48 hours of booking. So it would have to be some sort of elaborate scheme where prosecutors are working in conjunction with the police who are arresting individuals for crimes. Uh, disposition dates. So the 2007 experiment uh, doesn't rely on your booking date. It relies on when you're actually your case is being decided. And so disposition dates are generally uh, pre-scheduled well in advance. So that limits the scope for temporal displacement in 2007. And then also in 2007, the electoral outcome was unexpected. Uh, they thought that this bond was going to pass. And so you can look at the news reports uh, the day after, and everyone's like, oh my gosh, 
this happen. We aren't going to be able to expand the jail. And so if somebody was trying to strategically optimize around the change in 2007, they would be optimizing in the wrong direction because the outcome that they were expecting to happen didn't actually occur. But we don't have to take on faith that these uh, features ensure the viability of the experiment. We can actually look at the data to see whether or not there are similarities in the number of cases that are getting filed or disposed, um, or if the characteristics of the case are, are comparable. All right, so this is looking at the caseload density, where in contrast to the prior plots, I'm showing you now um, all of the dots at the daily level. And what we can see is that, um, you know, there's, as we approach the discontinuity, there's kind of a lot of movement on both sides, but there isn't any sort of significant uh, difference that we observe in terms of the size uh, or the number of cases that are being brought. Unlike the diversion case where there's a really clear break between the left side and the right side of the discontinuity. And to summarize a variety of other factors, so I'm just going to be plotting these numbers, which are measuring the size of the gap rather than showing you all of the graphs. Uh, we can see that across um, the caseload size, the total number of prior misdemeanor convictions that you have on your record, your age at charge, whether or not you are male, and race and ethnic information, all of these are going to be balanced uh, before and after um, uh, the discontinuity comes into effect. So, it looks like on the observable margins that we have, it does not seem like the population is changing. <clears throat> so that limits this um, opportunity for selection bias, that other factors other than what's changing in the court and how people are getting processed is actually what's influencing the future outcomes. All right, so estimates so far have been reported in terms of sharp changes at the discontinuity. And so sharp changes are just saying, What's the size of the gap between the line on the left side and the line on the right side as it reaches the discontinuity? But moving forward, we want to talk about fuzzy changes at the discontinuity because we're going to be trying to estimate treatment effects of diversion. And because the size of the change in diversion between 1994 and 2007 are different, we're going to be scaling the impact that we observe on outcome variables by that size, uh, that change in um, the uh, uh, diversion rate uh, between the two experiments. So recall that um, in 1994, the first stage uh, change was about 0.24. So you can think of multiplying whatever discontinuity we measure for something like reoffending rates by the number four or dividing by 0 0.24, 0 0.25. And on the 2007 experiment, it's going to be multiplying by around five. Okay. So how did uh, changes in diversion impact disposition and sentencing outcomes? So when somebody experiences a diversion, what does that mean in terms of the actual sanctions they experience um, for the criminal charges that were brought? Are they avoiding incarceration sentences? This is really important for interpreting our results. So what we can observe is that in 1994, what we call a diversion is essentially solely a um, court deferral. So there's no change in dismissal rates. This is really only operating on the court deferral margin, and that makes sense because of the way that the law was written. If somebody was going to get dismissed, they were going to get dismissed no matter what. In 2007, though, it's interesting to see that these courts responded to the electoral outcome by not just um, giving higher rates of deferrals, they actually just got rid of a bunch of cases by dismissing them straight out. Um, it's not clear why they did that, but it's interesting that they did that. In either case, both of these um, interventions are opportunities to avoid having a felony conviction record. So we are grouping them together as diversions. In 1994, there looks like there's some reduction in the likelihood of getting a fine if you were diverted, and some small reduction in the likelihood of getting an incarceration sentence. But in practice, what we'll see is that there's no difference in the likelihood that they entered onto probation because of this probation, uh, sorry, entered onto incarceration because of this probation before incarceration requirement. In 2007, it's different. Like the counterfactual when you get diverted is not going to be the same thing as what we're observing in 1994. People are avoiding um, incarceration sentences. They tend to be very short in practice. And after about a year, we see no difference in actual amount of time spent in prison. But this is a fundamental difference um, between these two natural experiments. We also see an increased likelihood of getting fined. Um, so as we go through and interpret the results, 
we want to think about when we see consistent results between the two experiments on outcomes, things like if uh, reoffending rates are going in similar directions in terms of their causal impact or labor market outcomes are going in similar rates, we have to think about what's common between these two natural experiments. What's common is that both are giving people the opportunity to avoid a felony conviction. If we're observing differences in the impacts uh, between the two experiments, then we have to think about, well, what is different between these two experiments? And it could be like, perhaps incarceration is playing a very important role in influencing the outcomes that we see. So if we see differences between the two, maybe the fact that incarceration is a bigger deal in one than the others is um, like an important, um, is an important mediating factor. All right, so this is now plotting the exact same um, caseload. So it's still the same exact individuals with their original charge dates uh, that we saw before. But now on the y-axis, I'm plotting the average number of future crimes these groups commit over the next 10 years. Does anybody want to take a stab at interpreting what we're seeing here? Yep. The recidivism rates are much higher when the deferral goes down. That's right. All right, so what does that potentially suggest? That we should do deferral more. <laughs> <laughs> I agree, uh, but before we get there, that potentially uh, diversion and deferrals are decreasing the likelihood that individuals are reoffending. Okay, so this is just showing the sharp change. So we see a change of um, in the whole caseload by about 0.25 and negative 0.24 over there, and now we're going to scale them up by the size of the first stage to try to estimate a treatment effect because not everyone on the caseload is experiencing a change in diversion. Only a quarter of the caseload is experiencing a change in diversion. All right, so what this would suggest when we put this into a fuzzy RD framework is that diversion decreases the rate of having any convictions by about 30 percentage points in 1994 and 26 percentage points in uh, 2007, and when we test the quality of these coefficients, we can't reject the null that they're the exact same thing. All right, so what does that mean? Let's think about the scale of that effect. For this population, individuals who have been charged with their first felony crime, over the next 10 years, 70% of them will be charged with a new offense. 70%, that's incredibly high. What is diversion doing? It's almost cutting that number in half. So that means that over 10 years, they don't commit any future crimes. That's astounding in terms of thinking about a potentially successful intervention. It's very hard to, to decrease reoffending rates. The total number of convictions avoided per uh, diversion is about 1.6 and 1.7. And again, we can't reject that these are the exact same thing. Now, what's the composition of the crimes uh, that are being avoided? We can see that in 1994, it looks largely driven by reductions in drug convictions and property offenses. And in 2007, it seems more heavily driven by property offenses and violent convictions. But we don't have the precision to say whether or not we're, these are statistically significantly different from each other. So my takeaway from this is that it looks like there's reductions surely in property convictions, for both groups, and then suggestive evidence that both drug and violent convictions are also uh, being reduced, potentially at um, a more sensitive margin. All right, so if we think about what do we take from a reduction in property offenses, so what are examples of property offenses? What does that mean? Yep. Vandalism? Vandalism, but at the felony level, this is going to be uh, property offenses that are between um, like $1,500 and $20,000. So you could get to that level, but typically what we're talking about are going to be things like burglary, uh, car theft, uh, serious uh, grand larceny, um, serious um, kind of crimes that involve acquisition of goods uh, for, for value. So that might suggest that individuals aren't able to support themselves financially. So let's look at their um, average quarterly employment rates over the next 10 years. And it's hard to see uh, based off the lines, but we're seeing some suggestive evidence that across the discontinuity that um, when individuals have uh, the access to diversion, they have better labor market outcomes. So let's do the same exercise and scale this by um, the first stage. 
And what we're finding is that there's increased, very clear evidence in 1994 that um, divergent improved labor market outcomes. It improves quarterly employment rates by about 20 percentage points. And again, that's close to a doubling of employment rates over this 10-year um, follow-up period. And it's not just um, you know, any, any old job. There are um, increasing employment in uh, jobs that are greater than the federal poverty level, which I have to say, admittedly, is quite low. I think during this time period, it was about $2,000 per quarter. But there's an increase in um, uh, kind of not just like trivial jobs where somebody's picking up $20 a quarter. There's increases in their log earnings as well as their total earnings. And where we see the uh, largest increase in employment is going to be in industries where convicts typically don't work. Things like education or health. Industries that are uh, precluded uh, or um, have limitations for individuals with felony convictions. Now, the signs and the magnitudes of the coefficients in 2007 are pretty much the exact same thing that we see in 1994. We don't have the statistical precision in order to say that they are different from zero, but we also can't reject whether or not they're the exact same thing that we estimated in 1994. So, the 2007 experiment is a little bit weaker in terms of the amount of um, random variation that we have in diversion, so we just don't have the precision to say that the results hold up there. But it is suggestive, especially given the reoffending results that we observe, that we're observing similar phenomena that are playing out in two time periods, uh, 14 years apart. All right, let's look at the timing of these impacts. We go until 15, uh, 10 to, anyway, great. So, we can look at year by year the number of crimes that have been prevented in this case. So, so here what I'm plotting are the coefficients from the scaled estimates, including reoffending outcomes through year one through year five. So this is accumulating the total impacts over time. Now, what we can do in 1984 that we can't do in 2007 is we can actually go even 20 years out, so well into somebody's life, once these guys have reached middle age. We can't do that in 2007 because that doesn't exist yet, right? We haven't yet reached 20 years out from 20, uh, 2007. So what we can see is that there's an immediate decrease in the first few years. While these individuals are on their diversionary agreements, recall that they're about two or three years long. But then there's still increasing declines, um, or that's confusing language, there's still improvements in terms of reductions in criminal activity that are persisting well out into their lives. So this seems like something that's kind of fundamentally reshaping these um, individuals' trajectories, and it's a similar phenomenon that we see in 2007. We can do the same exercise for employment, and here it's even more clear that you set individuals up for an initial period of success during their diversionary agreements, but then they also take the baton and run with it. So they continue to improve their lives and even you know, in this 15 to 20 year period later, we see clear evidence that they're continuing to have better um, employment outcomes. And we see a very similar phenomenon occurring in 2007. All right. So who benefits the most from diversion? We're gonna explore heterogeneous treatment effects, which is a fancy way of saying uh, uh, you know, who is more or less responsive in terms of improvements in uh, reoffending rates or employment rates based off of their pre-existing characteristics. And to do that, we're going to create an index of predicted reoffending, uh, where we regress total convictions over 10 years on your observable covariates, things like race, uh, ethnicity, age, sex, and the total number of misdemeanor records that you have. And we're going to take that predicted value and take this row hat and line everybody up according to their percentile in the distribution of row hat. So what does that look like in 1994? The total number of future convictions that we're predicting, it goes up from left to right. And who are these individuals? As you go from left to right, you're getting individuals who are younger on average. We're getting individuals who are more likely to be black. And we're getting individuals who have a higher number of prior misdemeanor, misdemeanors. Right. I think an important caveat to this exercise is, you know, this is, um, we present this as a predicted recidivism risk index, but if certain sub-communities uh, within Houston are being targeted by the police, 
Um, it could be that reoffending rates or just criminal activity in general is equal across all of these groups, but this is a measure of who's getting targeted by police. All right, so let's look at who benefits. So these are now lining up across each percentile of the risk distribution. What are the impacts on their reoffending rates? And what we're seeing clearly in both 1994 and 2007 is it's at the top end of the distribution where we see the largest gains being made in terms of reducing reoffending rates. So it's going to be young black men with a misdemeanor record who are benefiting most from diversion when they would be predicted to be the ones least likely to warrant getting it because they have the highest risk of reoffending. You see a similar factor where at the right end of the distribution, you know, the standard error is going to be a lot larger because we're slicing up our sample into a lot of smaller units. But at the right end of the distribution, you also see that's where we're getting most of our employment effects, uh, impacts from. All right, so let's interpret the empirical results. We believe that three mechanisms drive these results. There are two direct mechanisms. So we first think that avoiding a felony conviction is really important. So there's a lot of work out there um, using audit and correspondence studies where individuals either hire actors to go apply for jobs or they create randomly generated resumes and apply for jobs. And um, they uh, find consistently that if you have a felony record or if you mark that you have a criminal background, that that limits your access to jobs. You're less likely to get a callback. Okay. So what we're finding is going to be the first evidence actually in a real population uh, where this is actually playing out in practice. We also think that resentencing deterrence is playing a role. So during that initial you know, two to three year period, there's a lot at stake to avoid criminal activity. You don't want to screw up and do some sort of minor offense because you'll be brought back in and you'll get that felony conviction. So that is also um, discouraging criminal activity, but it's going to be during a narrow window at the very beginning. And we've seen evidence that the effects persist after and potentially even grow further. And then there's one indirect uh, that I didn't have time to present evidence on today. But uh, we call this an amplification effect. So over time, if we look at the um, reoffending uh, outcomes, over time, those who kind of got the bad luck of the uh, draw, let's look at this, luck of the straw, straw of the straw, luck of the draw, <laughs> bad luck of the draw, so they're reoffending. What does that mean if they reoffend? They're getting more convictions. They're getting more sanctions. They're having more experiences of incarceration and probation. So the effective dosage between our treatment and control group of the criminal justice system is expanding over time. Okay, so that's going to be one factor that has to be thought about as playing a role. It's not just going to be um, whether or not somebody got one conviction or not 20 years later, because their lives have come completely gone in different tra trajectories. What do we think? aren't driving these results. Um, uh, there are technical issues about how revocations are handled um, and whether or not that influences new charges being brought. Uh, we have missing labor market outcomes for a subset of our sample that we don't have social security numbers for. That's not a, a big deal when we look at that. Immediate incarceration or long-term incapacitation, that doesn't seem to be it. Let me just summarize the, the um, conclusion. So, Diversion is associated with very large decreases in offending as well as improvement in labor market outcomes. And additional benefits seem to accrue even 20 years out. Um, the stigma of a felony conviction, to me, I think is a really important mechanism here. And this is a very low cost intervention. We aren't adding any more resources to the criminal justice system. So if we think about a cost benefit analysis or just a benefit benefit analysis, we could spend less money and have better public welfare outcomes. So uh, I think that this is something that we should be expanding our use of in society. Thank you very much.